B'Shem Hashem, Na'ase V'Nasliach. Welcome to our weekly Zera Shimshon Shiur on the parasha. Today's parasha is Parashat Mesora. We are going to discuss the first Ot, Ot Aleph, or Ma'amar Aleph of the Zera Shimshon in the parasha. This Shiur is dedicated to Le'ilu Nishmat Ya'aqob ben Binyamin <coughs> Nili from the Nili family. May his neshama have an aliyah. And also... Um, Emmanuel ben Munavar, Rafael ben Munavar, <coughs> Afshin Joshua Babazadeh, and Yafabat Bibijan, Nisan Haim ben Helen, and Nisan ben Shalom. And Moshe ben Chaim, Moshe, whose your side is today. Yes. Thank you for reminding me. And Daniel Bulur. So the Gemara says in Perek Gimel of Arachin. <coughs> I want everyone to really pay attention tonight to this shiur. And we want to take it in. We really want to take it in. A lot of important points being made. As opposed to the other ones. Ah, <laughs> uh, you're getting started already, I see. You want to go there? Okay. The Gemara says as follows, Amar Rabbi Shemol Bar Nachmeni, Amar Rabbi Yohanan. Rabbi Shemol Bar Nachmeni says in the name of Rabbi Yohanan, Al Shiva Devarim, on seven different things, by things we mean sins. Seven different sins. Al Shiva Devarim Negaim Ba'in. On seven different sins, the Negat Sara'at come, would come on, upon the person. The defect or the, or, the, um, or the sickness of tzara'at, on seven different sins. You must know what these seven were actually. The Gemara says, Al shivar Al Hara, number one, numero uno, is Lashon Hara, Val Shvichut Tamim, on murder, Val Shavuat Shav, on someone, God forbid, says God's name, swears in God's name in vain. Val Gilui Arayot on um, 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 what's the word? Gilui Arayot is ah again um, no being um, Gilui Arayot is marriage between ad- adultery and marriage between those that are not allowed. Val gasut haruach on arrogance, believe it or not, once again, one of the sins that would bring about tzara'at was arrogance compared to murder. Arrogance. Val gezel and on theft and tzarot ha'ayin and on, oh wait, and the other one, the last one is on stinginess. If a person was stingy, they would, God forbid, get the tzara'at. Now, so Zerah Shimshon is going to talk about the one that we're going to talk about tonight, which is Lashon Hara. So this is Al-Avon Lashon Hara. So the tzara'at would come on the sin of Lashon Hara, negative speech. And the Gemara asks over there, that Rabbi, on, in that Gemara, Rabbi Anani Bar Shushan says, bar, sorry, Rabbi Anani Bar Sasson says that the me'il of the Kohen, uh, of the Kohen, the me'il was the robe. There were different particles of clothing that the Kohen or the Kohen Gadol would wear. One of them was the me'il, it was just the robe. The robe, the me'il that the Kohen would wear, that the, the, the me'il of the Kohen Gadol was, mechaper al Roshon Hara. That me'il, its segula was that it brought forgiveness for the sin of Lashon Hara. Meaning, different clothings that the Kohen Gadol would wear had different segulot, had different jobs. The job of the Me'il was that it brought a kapara, forgiveness for the sin of Lashon Hara for all of Am Yisrael. So, here's another thing that we, we didn't know. The Kohen Gadol walking around with his clothes, with his kedusha. Just wearing those clothes and doing the avodah and doing the services in those clothes would automatically bring forgiveness for different sins. The me'il, the robe, brought forgiveness for Lashon Hara. So the Gemara asks, Mamash, wow, that's crazy. 
I just thought about you and you just walked through the door. Not in a good way. I was like, where is that? <laughs> and then you walk. In my mind, I was saying, Chas We were talking about Lashon Hara, and yeah. <laughs> you're good. Vaim Ken. So the Gemara asks, if so, if the Me'il brings forgiveness for the sin of Lashon Hara, if you're telling me that this, that this robe that the Kohen Gadol would wear would bring kapara, would bring forgiveness for Lashon Hara, then what was, the, what was the use of having Sara'at? At the end of the day, what's Sara'at for? We discussed this before. This, the godly system, the heavenly system of punishment, the Torah system of punishment is not for the sake of punishment. It's not like the jail system that we have running today. Like a person steals... Right? If it's over <laughs> if it's over a thousand dollars in California, and if they if the processing of paperwork doesn't take too long, if they spend some time in jail, right? Or if they have bigger sins and they're actually in jail, a lot of times what happens, a lot of times unfortunately, they come out worse than they went in. They, they this 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 is actually something that is spoken about a lot, right? That people go to jail. And they learn new ways of how to not get caught. Like, oh, what did we do wrong so to be thrown into jail? This time we'll do it differently. Right? Unfortunately. This is something that happens. But the system of the Torah is not the same. The punishments that come upon, God forbid, we should never know. But a punishment that comes upon a person is not for that person to suffer. The punishment is a way for that person to re- receive kapara, forgiveness. All the different things that come as quote-unquote, those that are listening to the recording, I'm making quotation marks with my fingers. Um, those things in the Torah, mitzvot in the Torah that Hashem says, if you don't do, this shall happen, or if you do, this shall happen to you. All those punishments, they're not there out of spite or because Hashem says, oh, you did it, now I'm going to punish you. They're actually there to bring forgiveness for that person. It's needed. It's a part of the... Um, process of the person being able to um, 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 like release themselves, purify themselves in the world. That's why, God forbid, the capital sins, a person that does a capital sin, why do they have a capital punishment for that? Like somebody that was caught murdering and there's witnesses of the murder, he is put to death. The death penalty in the Torah is not because, oh, you killed someone, so you have to, you know, you killed, so you're killed. It's because the only way for that neshama to receive kapara, forgiveness, is for that neshama to feel the same thing the other individual felt, so to speak. Or that neshama to feel the disconnect that that neshama caused, that soul caused, through the, the act of that avera. For instance, believe it or not, this reminded me of Ripley's. If you don't know what that is, don't say it. You're going to make me feel old and it's not cool. Okay? But believe it or not, for instance, someone that breaks Shabbat on purpose, according to the Torah, has a death penalty. I'm not going to go into the details. But that's what the Torah says. Just understand the capacity of what the secretion of Shabbat really does. Why does it need the death penalty? Not because God just hates you, hates the person, God forbid. It's because what is done through the act of breaking Shabbat is so severe in the upper realms that the only forgiveness brought about by a person that publicly, on purpose, in front of people, desecrates Shabbat out of spite, the only way for that person, that soul to receive forgiveness is through that punishment. Claro? Yeah? Okay. So now, so we said that the negat tzara'at, the tzara'at, the punishment, I mean the forgiveness was brought upon by the me'il of the Kohen Gadol that, that, that he wore. The, the robe of the Kohen Gadol. The Gemara asks, hold on a second, if the me'il of the Kohen Gadol, if the robe of the Kohen Gadol brings forgiveness for someone that spoke Lashon Hara, so why is there such a thing at tzara'at? Why would they get tzara'at then? 
If the Gemara says a person that spoke Lashon Hara would get Tzara'at, then why get Tzara'at? If it's all for the same reason to bring forgiveness, then he's receiving forgiveness through the robe of the Kohen Gadol. He doesn't need Tzara'at. You're giving him the punishment for no reason. So the Gemara answers, Look, Asha, it's not a question. I'll simply answer you. This is a famous answer from the Gemara. The Gemara says, Ha! De'ahanu ma'asav. Guys, listen, this is so important. When does tzara'at come upon a person that has spoken Lashon Hara? Is if that Lashon Hara that he spoke about the other individual got out. God forbid. And it got out in a way that it has now affected that other person. For instance, you put the Lashon Hara on a WhatsApp chat. Or you put it on your Instagram story and you have 2,000 followers. To you at that moment was funny. To a lot of people watching it was hilarious. But now the Lashon Hara has gone out and it has negatively affected the person that the Lashon Hara was spoken about. People are going to laugh at them. I've said this before. Remember a few years back, there was a video that went viral. I don't want to say what country it was from, whatever. It was a, it was a Jewish person. <laughs> Can you send it to me? I want to slap you right. <laughs> so it went viral. And it was funny. I got to tell you, you know, at that time, this was years ago, you know, and things were going around. I remember I even watched it. I felt uh, it was funny. Okay? <laughs> It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean because it was funny, it was okay. It was funny. Okay? Later on, I found out the family of that person had sent out a, like a letter to everyone about how miserable that video has made their lives. For something that had happened by accident, it was caught on camera and it became viral. And their whole life had, become, had, had been turned upside down. When I read that, it was like someone dumped a bucket of cold water on my head. I was like, wow. We can't even understand, we can't even, like, nobody, I didn't think about it. I don't think anybody thought about it. But this person came out and was like, to you it was funny. But like, it ruined their lives. Because everyone was now laughing at their family because of some stupid thing that had happened to them. We don't realize the level that Lashon Hara has reached in our days today. Because of social media, it's a different level. It used to be a person would speak Lashon Hara about somebody, there was a chance that you could make amends and talk it out of the person and say, listen, I made a mistake, don't let it get out, I don't want you to, I make me, I'll make you swear, don't let it get out. And maybe you would be able to put a stop to it. Now, click of a finger. Boom. Millions of people could watch the same video or read the same exact article, and it's done. It's out. It's put its effect, and there's nothing you can do about it. So the Gemara says, you know something? On Lashon Hara that didn't have a chance to have its effects, the robe of the Kohen Gadol would actually be Mekaper. The robe of the Kohen Gadol would bring forgiveness for that kind of Lashon Hara. However, if it already got out, there was no way to bring it, take it back then that person would actually see the wrath of their own avera, of their own sin, through the tzara'at, through, through that mystical, spiritual disease that we call tzara'at. So the Zerah Shimshon says, I'i hanuma asav, if what he did actually got out, atu negayimale, then these deformities and defects of tzara'at would come upon that person. But if they didn't get out, and it didn't change anything, then the me'il, then the robe of the Kohen Gadol would actually bring that person forgiveness. Now the Zerah Shemishon asks on this, he says, Kashe, it's hard to understand. That it says, it seems from the Gemara, sheyesh kapara le'avon lashon hara, it seems that the Gemara is saying that there is forgiveness, there is a fix for, lash, for, the, for the sin of lashon hara. 
there is somehow some kind of forgiveness. Deha, the Gemara itself says, Rabbi Abba, but Rabbi Hanina Ama, Rabbi Abba, the son of Rabbi Hanina said, Me, somebody that, that said, Lashon Hara, he himself in the Gemara says, Someone that spoke Lashon Hara, En Lo Takana. He has no fix. There is no, um, um, what's, the word, what's another word for fix? There is no rectification for it. There is no fix for it. There is no way to take it back. Why does he say this? Listen to the words of David HaMelech. This should literally, it should make us shake in our boots. Because he says, David HaMelech says, Shkvar kerato David beruach hakodesh. David Amelech cut that person off through his ruach hakodesh, through his divine nevuah, uh, uh, um, 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 his prophecy. Because David Amelech saw that lashon hara is so bad that it has no forgiveness, as he says in Tehilim, Yachret Hashem, Hashem will cut off, which is the worst thing that could happen to Enishama. Hashem could should can cut will cut off. Kol sifte chalakot, lashon medaberet gedolot, all tongues that speak, so to speak, lashon hara. Meaning, David Amelech through prophecy already said that lashon hara is a sin that has no takana. There is no fix. There is no forgiveness. It's it's the worst. I mean, we could understand through what David Amelech, through history what David Amelech means. Right? We are still in the second Galut today, in the second destruction of the second temple. We're still in this exile because of Lashon Hara. The second temple was destroyed because of Lashon Hara. And we're still in this exile because of it. Just because we couldn't speak nicely about each other. That's it. That's how horrible it is. So David Amalek through prophecy already said, this is so destructive, there is no fix. You can't rectify it. There's no way. So that's why the Zerah Shimshon is asking. Zerah Shimshon says, hold on. One place in the Gemara says that there is a fix for it, either the Kohen Gadol's robe or Tzara'at. Another place, the Gemara says there is no fix, nothing. Nothing can get rid of it. person that speaks Lashon Hara, they're doomed. It's over. Some people are thinking... <laughs> Might as well just continue, because I'm done. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Peace! <laughs> it's like, imagine doing all the wrong things, and your friend comes up to you and goes, man, stop, what, what happened to you? Ah, man, I spoke so much Lashon Hara, I'm done with, so I can just, I'm going to Vegas tonight. <laughs> you know, I'll be gambling all night long, I'll be drinking, I mean, that's it, because I spoke Lashon Hara. Rabbi said, No. We're not done yet. Listen. So he says there's a discrepancy here. Is there a fix or is there no fix? What is it? What's the answer? Did someone have a question before we go into the thing? Malka, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to wait until the top. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you do that. I feel a fight coming along. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. You don't scare me. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know why I do it to myself. Veyesh lomar. <laughs> so he starts to answer the question somehow, and he says, "The Gemara says in the first parak of Moed Katan, Hey Amud Aleph, um, page Daf five, Amud Aleph." It says in a Braita, the Pasuk that says in Vaikra that we just actually will read, it says, This is something really interesting. In the times of the temple, or in the times of even before the temple, when the Jews were, Tzara'at had already begun, it says that a person that would have this disease, which was a spiritual disease, would have Tzara'at, they would have to be excommunicated. They would live outside of the encampment of the Jews, outside of the city walls. 
And in fact, if you had, <clears throat> if you had, how say, if you had like three, four people that all had sarat, ten people that all had sarat, they couldn't be together outside of the city. This wasn't like a quarantine minyan. You know, how like when COVID hit, people that all had COVID, they would be in like one hotel together, chilling, having dinner, lunch, you know, doing minyanim, because they all like, when it came to, when it came to tzara'at, it was not like that. But the Chumash uses the word quarantine. Last yeah, that's what it was. They were quarantined outside of the city, but they're not, it's not the same quarantine that we unfortunately you know, it's funny how these days when we talk about quarantine, everyone's so familiar with it. Everyone has memories. It's like, oh, I mean, right? Sadly. But it wasn't the same thing. People that were quarantined at the same time couldn't be together because it would defeat the purpose. Because part of the purpose of being quarantined was for that person to be alone and recognize what it feels like to be alone. Because if you like speaking negatively about other people, maybe you shouldn't be around other people. Feel what it feels like not to be around other people. So next time you're about to say something negative about somebody else, maybe you want to think twice. Because you've already experienced not being with other people. That was part of the reason. Now, when this person was in quarantine outside of the city, imagine someone's going outside of the city to, I don't know, get water or like, they got into a fight with their wife and they're like, that's it, I'm done, I'm, I, need, I need a walk. And they decided to walk out of the city because they were losing their mind. They were like, if I stay home, it's going to be either me or her. <laughs> so I might as well, I'm going to go take a stroll. And he tried to calm down, but it ended up being he had to go all the way outside of the city to do it because he was losing his mind. I'm, I'm just making it as I go. But outside of the city, as he's sitting outside of the city, when people would walk by, it says, He has to call out. When he sees people coming around him, he has to say, Which means impure, impure, impure. He had to notify people out loud that he's tame and he has tara'at. Meaning, even if he could be secluded, like, please God, save me the embarrassment, please, please God. Have them not see me. Oh, that's my khale. Oh, it's khale. Oh, it's khale. No. Okay. Khale is ant in Persian, by the way. Not an ant. The aunt. Amat. <laughs> or no, that's actually khale. Uh, uh, <laughs> an aunt. Right? So he couldn't do that. He could not, or she could. Hey, why are we being, what? It's not only men that say, you know, say Lashon. Our women do t- sometimes also. Rarely. <laughs> All the women are cracking up. Okay. That in itself could be Lashon Hara, by the way. <laughs> About an entire race. <laughs> so, he has to call out, Tame Tame. So anybody that passes by, he can't hide himself. He has to notify people, Hey, Tame here, Tame here. I, I can't hide. God, please help me. Right? Why? So this is, this is what the Pasuk says he has to do. So the Zeresh, listen to what the Zeresh Shimshon brings. <laughs> he has to notify the public of his pain that he's experiencing, not physical pain, but the pain that he has, that he's in quarantine and he's being punished for something wrong that he did. Why? <laughs> and those, the public that hear his cries, Yevakshu <laughs> alav rachamim. They have to ask for mercy for that person. Hashem put this in place that the person that's in quarantine because of tzara'at has to call out tame tame, not just for the embarrassment, but also other Jews are obligated now to pray for mercy for that person. You can't just walk by and see someone in quarantine and go, <laughs> You deserve it? I heard what you said? I got the chat? <laughs> you know? That's it. I was on that chat. I exited because of you. <laughs> right? No. When they pass by and they see that person that posted that chat or whatever, Lashon Hara, it's their opportunity and it's their obligation to pray for that person. So that Hashem will have rachamim on them. Listen to this. This is beautiful. Bekashe says, but that's difficult. Lama Why is it with this, particularly this illness, of tzara'at, amra Torah tzarich 
Why is it that with this illness that the Torah says that the person has to let others know that he has this illness? Why not any other illness? Imagine it. Why is it that the person... <laughs> I'm just thinking ahead, I'm already making myself laugh. <laughs> Why is it that if the person, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> if he has something else, if the person, God forbid, has something else, why is it that the Torah does not say that he has to call that out? You know, I don't know, think of one yourselves and use your own imagination. <laughs> you know, why is it, because if you think about it, the Zerah Shimshon is bringing out a, an incredible point. Any other illness... Chas v'shalom, God forbid, we should never know, and no one should ever know of any illnesses. But anything else, where does it come from? At the end of the day, where does it come from? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, right? So why is it that the Torah does not obligate them to do the same thing for those, so that people will pray for them? Only when it comes to tzara'at, they're supposed to do it and ask for, so that people will ask for mercy for them. Others, they could do it, they don't want to do it, they don't have to do it. This is an obligation. Meaning he can't get out of it. Don't matter if it's da'i, khale, aunt, whoever's passing by, he has to just, he has to blurt it out. Why nothing else? That is, a, I, I thought that was an incredible question. That is an amazing question. It, it, it makes us understand through and through really why anything happens. And the Zerah Shimshon is saying, let's be honest, it's not just sarat that is caused by Akadosh Baruch Hu. Other things also, God forbid. You should never know. So, Ella, now, this is the kicker, people. This is what I mean, like, this, this will definitely help us. If already we don't understand, if already we don't understand the the extremity of what Lashon Hara does, how destructive it is, just listen to these words and you'll understand. We should all take a note from this. He says, so why is it that for other problems, the person doesn't have to scream anything out, but when it comes to Tzara'at, he has to, in order to receive mercy from Hashem, so that other people will pray for him. Why? El avada yata'amhi, the reason for sure has to be Shehoil, because the illness of tsara'at en lo takana. The illness of tsara'at has no fix. There is no cure for it. It's a terminal illness. Shekavar kerato David Baruch HaKodesh, as David HaMelech said in Tehillim, David HaMelech says, a person that spoke Lashon Hara and received Tzara'at, that person is a dead man. There is no cure. They're done for. There is no cure for that person. It's like already the judge has already passed the judgment and it is stamped. They're done. It's over. Therefore, Therefore, that person needs the prayers of the Rabbim. He needs the prayers of others. He needs the prayers of the community in order to be batel this gezara, to take away this bad gezara uh, from Akadosh Baruch Hu. And this is what it means, in lo takana. He has no way out. He has no way out. What does it mean? Lo levado. He himself, there is no way he can get out of it. The person themselves, there is no way to fix it. They have no power over it. They have a kemo yachid because he is just an individual. But, din de tzibur afal mit kareya. But we know from tradition that when it's a gezardin, when there is a judgment that has passed by Akadosh Baruch Hu, even if it is stamped by the king himself, if the public daven, if the public pray, Akadosh Baruch Hu rips up that gezardin and starts all over. 
So what does David HaMelech mean? David HaMelech says when a person speaks Lashon Hara and they have Tzara'at, there's no way to get out of it. He's like a dead man walking. They're done for. So what do we do? So therefore the Torah says, that person has to call out to every individual that passes by, so that that person will know that this person needs tefillot. So the public can pray for them. When public prays from the bottom of their heart for anything, even if it's something that judgment has already be, been passed through by a Kadosh Baruch Hu, he'll change the edict, he'll change the decree. It's as if it never even happened. That's why this one, with this ailment, ailment with this illness, he needs to call out Tameh Tameh because he needs the prayer of others. Other sicknesses, chas shalom, there is a cure for them. Nothing is written in stone. They can pray for themselves and HaKadosh Baruch Hu will have mercy. But Tzara'at is written in stone. The only cure is for, with public prayer. The public has to be involved. And you can understand why the public has to be involved. Because as we said, when a person speaks Lashon Hara, they're affecting everybody. Therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu built it into the system where you damaged everyone, now you need everyone's help for the cure. You need to be the one desperate for everyone to pray on your behalf. You're going to need it. So when people pass by, you're going to have to scream out, Tame, Tame, so that they'll know, they'll go back to camp and say, let's pray for so-and-so. He needs our tefillot. First of all, it's incredible to see the power of unity. To see the power of a unit praying together for something. There's nothing we cannot change. We just, we just passed Purim. How did we get out of the, the decree of Haman Arasha who wanted to annihilate the entire Jewish people? And he could have. How did we get out of it? By Esther Hamalka telling to Jews, we need to pray all of us together. Imagine. Imagine. All of the Jews that year, the first seder, the first night of Pesach, which we sit around Bezrat Hashem in a couple of weeks. Right now we're slaving. At least the men for the wives. But uh, <laughs> right now we're going to be sitting around the table. We, we enjoy ourselves. But imagine in the time of Mordechai and Esther, Pesach said their night, they were fasting. They fasted on Pesach. That was the tefillot that broke that decree. Because they realized how far they had gone. And the only way to, in, the only way to survive was... <laughs> even if it's Pesach, Mordechai said, even if it's Pesach, everyone has to fast. And everyone fasted. By the way, on Pesach, we sit around the table and we read the famous words, Avadim Hayinu. We were slaves in Egypt. Right? We read, Avadim Hayinu Mitzrayim. Right? Our forefathers were, were slaves in Egypt. Or some Persians go, should I do it in Persian? I, I know it in Persian. <laughs> <laughs> that just reminded so many of you, or your grandpa's grandma's like, okay, do it in Farsi now. Okay. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> so we say, <laughs> we were slaves, we were slaves in Egypt. And then what happens is, most, most of the time, the wives come out of the kitchen and they go, I don't know, whoever's saying that the slavery ended, I, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> the only people that don't feel that it ever ended is the poor wives. Because like, they do all the cleaning, they do all the taking care of everything, and then finally the men sit down at the table and they enjoy the whole dinner. They're still working, right? So they, there's a lot of credit that goes to those imahod, the mothers of our every generation. The amount of work and effort that goes into preparing everything, not only Pesach, especially Pesach, because they start very, very early. I mean, three months ago already, like someone, like my wife, like, oh, don't eat there, it's going to be chametz, I don't want to clean. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some people like already from like a month and a half ago, there's no more chametz in their home. Like they're already eating everything, like Baruch Hashem, everything's today, there's so many like gluten-free stuff, everything is potato starch. Potato starch cookies. Like, I, by the way, bought cookies from Kosher Market the other week. I have to say it was $6. <laughs> I didn't realize. I thought it was just cookies, right? So I go home and my wife goes, do you know you just paid $6 for these cookies? One sleeve of cookies. I go, what? What are you talking about? It's a, these are a dollar. She goes, 
not these. I go, how could it be $6 for cookies? So I look at it, she goes, read it. And it's, and it's gluten-free cookies. <laughs> so, if you're Persian, deal with the stomach ache. <laughs> I'm kidding. So, so he says, therefore, the person needs the tefillot. The person needs the tefillot of the public in order for him to be healed. Why? Because according to the nevuah, according to Tehillim of David HaMelech, David HaMelech said, there is no cure for tzara'at. So when there is no cure for something, it's like a written decree and sealed. The only way to get rid of a sealed decree is for the public to pray at the same time. That's why the Mitzorah needed everybody's help. That's why you had to sit and ask for, for, for tefillot. The <clears throat> odd. And furthermore, It says, another way that you could see that there's no contradiction in the Gemara, the Gemara is actually saying to us, yes, it's true that we said that the Gemara is saying that there is a cure for, um, for Tzara'at. So why, why do we need Metzorah? We just answered it, why? Because there... It's, there is a cure, but the cure is not the regular cure as everything else. Because this part, this type of illness, the tzara'at, was, was an incurable disease. In the sense that the person themselves, when that edict was sent, when the decree was made, the, for the person to have tzara'at, they're not supposed to be cured. The only reason it's cured is because of tefillot of Rabin. In itself, tzara'at is not a curable disease. It's not. There were people, by the way, that had tzara'at all their life. That's a story for another time. The Gemara says, the Gemara says, here, it's a second kind of an answer. He says, the Gemara says in Brachot Nun Vav Amud Aleph, Kirilat Chacham, the curse of a Chacham, the curse of Chas Shalom, the curse of a Talmid Chacham, Afilu Al Chinam Hiba'a. Even if it was for no reason, it still has its effect. How careful we have to be with Talmidei Chachamim and Sadiqim, with the righteous. It says that if a righteous person, Chas Shalom, curses somebody, even if it doesn't have so much of a reason, it'll still happen. Because they're very, very powerful. They're dear to Hashem. And when it says for no reason, it doesn't mean for no reason. If a person upsets a Chacham even a little bit, for the, pers- for the Chacham to feel upset enough to say something to them, Chas Shalom, it could come true right away. But it says, but there is a Takana. But there is a cure. It's not a complete seal of judgment. It is sealed, but there is a takana. What's the takana? It says, oh, what it means, the, the kalala, the curse of a Talmud Chacham, it says that, God forbid, it's instant death. It could, be, it could mean death for that person. But it says, but there is a fix, there is a cure. Why? Lelech begalut, for that person to go into exile. Why? The Amar Mar, because Mar says in the Gemara, galut, Mechaperet al avon shasa. Over there, the Gemara says that galut exile, a person that goes into exile brings kapara, brings forgiveness for the worst sins that would have actually a decree of mitabi de shamayim, death from heaven. If there was a decree of a person to God forbid die before their time from heaven, when the person goes into galut, it's as if they've experienced death. Just goes to show how bad exile is. Meaning, when we sinned, especially by the second temple, when we sinned, HaKadosh Baruch Hu decreed all of Am Yisrael to go into exile. Why? Because the other side of the coin was annihilation. So Hashem said, either I have to annihilate the entire nation, or the other side is galut, exile, which is the same as, God forbid, death. When I, when, I, when I think about it, most of us here are children of, of uh, people that came from other countries. Right? Myself, 
My parents came from Iran. Those that come from other countries to a country, they don't speak the language of, they don't understand their customs. It's, it's exile. It's, it's literally exile. Imagine what, what our parents, our grandparents went through. So much so that the Gemara says a person that goes into exile, it's like death. It's so hard, it's so bad, they're experiencing death in life. The embarrassment they go through. The, the, the things they have to do to pick up their life. The, the, the hardship and the heartache they have to go through thinking of the future, of what's going to happen with their children. I, I, couldn't imagine, I, I couldn't imagine the pain. Right? So he says, Galut, exile, is the takana for so many of the worst sins. Umishum hachi. Therefore, the person that would speak Lashon Hara and would have Tzara'at, those, the Tzara'at would come upon them. Shehiyeh muhra lelech begalut. Because tzara'at was an incurable disease. Because in, it was incurable, which meant they would die. It was like death. Therefore, the Torah already prescribes that person to go into exile, go out of the city. When that person goes out of the city and sits there, bab yele kapara, that exile itself is a part of the kapara itself, would bring part of the forgiveness itself. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu literally built into the system, built into the punishment, the cure itself. So David HaMelech said, yes, it's an incurable disease. The person that speaks Lashon HaRazah, they're done for. He was right. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu put into the punishment itself, the cure. Part of the cure was the fact that he goes into exile. That exile would bring the forgiveness. In that exile, they would, they would scream out to people passing by, Tame, Tame, so that people would pray for them. That prayer would bring them forgiveness, Kapara, and finally make them Tahar, purify them from the Tzara so they can go back home. It just, to, in today's modern day, Lashon Hara has become. A different animal completely. So much so that we have to study again sometimes what really entails, what, what really is Lashon Hara. There was a day that Lashon Hara meant you sit with your friend and you talk to them and you tell them, oh, you hear what Jasmine did? Oh, she is, I gotta tell you, you, got, you guys don't know Jasmine, so it's okay. <laughs> but, or they would sit with you and be like, yeah, Shana. <laughs> but what I'm telling you is true, so it's not Lashon Hara. That's the biggest lie in the world, right? Because it's true, it's not Lashon Hara. I know it's a fact. She told me herself that she did it. Right? 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 But we don't realize what 50 years ago was Lashon Hara of two people sitting together and talking to each other about one person. It might get out, it might not get out. You're playing a gamble. Or if you wanted to take it back, hours later, you could take it back, call, call up that person and be like, listen, what I told you about Shana, just please don't tell anybody. It was Lashon Hara. It was so horrible, right? Yom Kippur, right before Yom Kippur, you would probably go find Shana and go, Shana, will you forgive me if there's anything that I ever did to you? And Shana would be like, what'd you ever do to me? I don't know. I'm just asking you forgiveness. Will you forgive me? Just tell me if you're going to forgive me or not. People ask for forgiveness before Yom Kippur. Can't I just ask you for forgiveness? Shana used to be nicer. Right? And then Shana says, of course I forgive you. I love you. You've never done anything wrong to me. I know. I would never do anything wrong to you, Shana. And that would be the end of that. Right? But then today, Lashon Hara is a different animal. Completely. It's just a button. You send out a text. You put something on a chat. You, you share something on your, on your wall, on your Instagram, on your Snapchat, and it's over. Do you know today how many teenagers in high schools think about suicide over the stupidest things all because of social media? It's not a joke. It's all because of Lashon Hara, of people posting things that they did taking videos of something somebody did in middle of class or doing something, whatever it is, and they send it out and they destroy someone's life. That's how far Lashon Hara has gone. So we have these smartphones that is literally digging us into the, you know, depths of hell 
to be precise. These smartphones, they're not so smart. They've made things extremely difficult for us. We have to be so careful what we say. We have to be so careful what we share. You know, I've stopped, I've literally stopped joining groups. People put me in groups, I exit right away. I just don't want it. I don't want to be involved in it. I don't want, like, there are so many chats that so many people have put me in, friends of mine. God knows how much things have been spoken about me, like, ah, we, we can't even talk to him anymore. He's not joining us in the chat. I'd rather not. I don't want to be in the chats. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to, you know, it's, it's, it, it becomes the worst type of Lashon Hara. Because in, in one moment, there's 300 people on a chat. At one moment, you just got wholesale Lashon Hara, everybody discount. Everyone gets it at the same time. Cheap. People's lives are destroyed. So we have to understand how extreme Lashon Hara is. David HaMelech says Lashon Hara is a sin that had a punishment from heaven, the Tzara'at, that was instant and incurable. It was meant to stay and destroy that person's life. How severe does that sin have to be to have such a punishment? It's huge. The only reason we don't have tzara'a today is because we're not on that level anymore. Times have become so bad that if Hashem wanted to punish the Jews for every little Lashon Hara, we would literally have the biggest tzara'at minyan in the world. Everyone would literally, well we couldn't, but I'm saying, everyone would probably have tzara'at. So the punishment can't be because we've, we've stooped so low. But I'll tell you this, to leave off on a negative note. Uh, on a... <laughs> not to leave on a negative note. To leave on a positive note. I missed the not. See what one little word can do. That was a lesson well learned. I did that on purpose. <laughs> so that everyone learns that lesson of what one little word can do. To leave on a positive note. <laughs> Imagine it this way. Every single time you're about to say Lashon Hara about somebody else. Every time you're about to say Lashon Hara about someone else. I'm talking more to the, to the guys because ladies, you don't need this. <laughs> Every time you're about to say Lashon Hara to anyone and you stop yourself immediately, think to yourself, you just brought redemption one step closer. Moshiach will come the moment we start getting along. The moment we start getting along with each other, Moshiach will come, we will be saved. There will be no more wars, no more sicknesses. Every time you stop yourself from speaking Lashon Hara, say, I did that in the Zuchut of Rufwa Shalema of all the sick people. Do you know what a Zuchut that is? Because it's very hard. It's really hard not to speak Lashon Hara. Especially in modern day. All we do all day long is speak about other people. We don't realize it. But the next time you're about to say something negative, even if it's true about somebody else, you stop, instantly think to yourself, you just brought the redemption that much closer. You just brought Rufu'a Shalema for some, some, somebody sick person. You just brought saving to someone that needs saving. That is what we can do. Today, that's what we need to do. Because I don't need to say it. We need it. We need it. We're desperate for it. There's so many people that need salvation. There are so many people, unfortunately, that need a refuah shalema. There are so many people that need children. I'm telling you, when you're about to speak Lashon Hara and you don't, give a blessing to a woman that's married that wants children and she doesn't have. You don't know how much that bracha, how far that bracha will go. You don't know how powerful it is because the Yetzer Hara that we have on a daily basis to speak Lashon Hara is powerful. So the moment we stop, we think of that person and go, Hashem, it is a chut that I just did not speak Lashon Hara. Please, uh, give children to so-and-so. That person wants to get married. Please find his zivuk for him or her zivuk for them. And in that zechut, we will mamash be able to experience the coming of Moshiach. Amen. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen. Amen.